In this video, we're going to introduce the fundamentals of analyzing project risk. Now, there are three types of project risk. Standalone risk, corporate risk, and market risk. And we'll introduce these three types. We'll talk about how we might measure them and also how we would apply that in making the financial decision to do a project or not. So what is standalone risk? This is the risk if it were all by itself, individual, right? Usually we measure this using the standard deviation of the project, or maybe it's coefficient of variation. The challenge here though is it really doesn't look at anything else or any other uh, impacts that this project might have on the rest of the company. So when would be the optimal time to look at standalone risk? Is when you initially start the company. Because there's nothing else going on. You're not adding anything to a already running company. So again, standard deviation ignores any diversification that might come from other projects, or, whether, or even shareholders diversification. It ignores those components. What is corporate risk? This is where we look at how does this project affect the riskiness of the company itself? So corporate risk is a function of this project's net present value and standard deviation and how that correlates with the rest of the company's net present value and standard deviations and its obvious overall correlation. So it looks at diversification from within inside the company. However, it doesn't uh, attribute anything to potential diversification from outside the company. That is, any diversification that's available from the investors or the shareholders of the company. So market risk is the project's risk to a well-diversified investor. So this is measured by the project's beta. It looks at both corporate and stockholder diversification. So it it really looks in the end of how does this ultimately impact the riskiness of this investment, this project? How does that impact the shareholders of a well-diversified portfolio? So which risk is the best risk? Well, market risk is the most relevant because it has to do with shareholders. And management's primary goal is to maximize the wealth of shareholders. However, corporate risk really is important for creditors, customers, suppliers, employees. And we probably shouldn't completely ignore it because it will have impact on what those stakeholders want from the company and the projects that it uh, undertakes. Which is the easiest one to measure? Standalone risk is the easiest to measure, right? Again, when it focuses on standalone risk, this is, again, it's a very easy kind of a thing to calculate. Now, as we mentioned, standalone risk is not theoretically correct. But it doesn't necessarily lead us to making bad decisions. And we'll talk about this as we go along in some of the, uh, the rest of this video. So are these risks highly correlated? If these three risks are highly correlated, that means using one over the other should not adversely or dramatically impact the decision that we make. So the answer here is yes. Most projects that the firm undertakes are in its core business. So standalone risk is likely to be highly correlated with its corporate risk. And in addition then, 
corporate risk is highly correlated with market risk. So again, if we're doing something, we're doing a project that already relates to something that we're doing, then standalone risk is probably just as good as any other risk when we're making a decision. So what types of risk analysis can we do? The first type of analysis is something called sensitivity analysis. This looks at the effect of changes in a variable on the project's net present value. So in order to do this sensitivity analysis, we assume that all the variables are fixed and, and at their expected values. And then we're going to change one variable. We'll let one variable change. And of course, then we will note what happens to net present value. Now, we've already done this in another video when we talked about the net present value profile. We looked at how does net present value change when one variable and one variable only, the weighted average cost of capital, when that changes. So that's the type of analysis that we do here. What we're looking for, for instance, if we did this and the one variable that we let change were the units sold. If we change units sold, um, the last project we were going to sell 100,000 units. What would happen if it was only 70 units, 70,000 or 80,000 or 90,000? Use each one of those levels and calculate the net present value at each one of those levels. We would end up with a graph like our net present value profile graph. And what we're interested here is not necessarily the values. We want to look at the slope of the line. The steeper the slope, the more important this variable is. And we really want to pay attention to those variables that have a significant impact on our decision making. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of this type of analysis, right? Again, we're going to look at specific variables to, to understand their importance. The challenge is, though, it really doesn't do anything at all with uh, talking about diversification. Um, it doesn't really incorporate any information about the possible magnitude of errors, right? We're assuming, what, 70,000, 8,000, it really doesn't address the chances of any of those things happen. So it really doesn't look at probabilities. So what would we say if our previous uh, example that we've been going through, if we expect inflation to be 5%, does that mean that is net present value then biased, right? The discount rate already has inflation in it. However, expected inflation rates obviously translate into higher nominal rates, right? So in inflation is in the weighted average cost of capital. So higher expected inflation also is going to be part of our cash flow forecast. So if those changes haven't been incorporated in the analysis, then net present value does have a problem. All this is saying is, if we expect inflation to impact our project, we need to incorporate that into the cash flows. We do not need to incorporate that into the weighted average cost of capital or the discount rate because it's already there. So here we have an example where we have inflation of 5%. We see how revenues are changing. We see how operating costs are changing. In the end, we end up with our cash flows at the bottom. And certainly, if you remember, they were 60s across the board. And now, because every year there's some inflation, every year there's going to be some changes in our free cash flows. And again, this shows up when we apply this to our... Um, cash flow worksheet. We can see how the numbers change. 
that also has impact on our net present value, our internal rate of return. This project, uh, in this case, turns out to be a positive value uh, project in, in net present value terms. So what's the next type of analysis we can do? This is something referred to as scenario analysis. In this case, we're going to kind of go one step further. We're not going to maybe just change one variable. But in this case, all we're going to do is change sales. What happens if sales change from 75 to 100 to 125,000 units? Now, the difference between this kind of analysis and sensitivity analysis is we're going to apply probabilities. So now, under 75,000 units, let's calculate the net present value. It's 43.1. What is it with 100,000? 10.4. 125,000 units. 63.9 is the net present value. But now, what are the probabilities that these this sales levels actually occur? Now we can then calculate, since we know what? There's a 25% chance of negative 43, 50% chance of 10, 25% chance of 63. Our expected net present value is 10.4, $10.04. The standard deviation of that is 37.8. Coefficient of variation, 3.6. So these are all levels of what? The statistics of this particular project. We can also do this in a worksheet, right? We have a worksheet for project risk analysis. You plug in the net present values and the probabilities and out comes our statistics for this particular project. So if this project's coefficient of variation, right? If the average for the company is between 1.25 and 1.75, what would this pro what would we say about this project? Well, since it has a coefficient of variation of 3.6, we would classify this as a very high risk project. So how would we what what would we do with this? Some sort of risk correction is required if we're doing this something that is far riskier than above average, or quite frankly, much if it's a lot less risk than we normally take. So maybe we need to adjust our weighted average cost of capital to reflect this higher risk. So it was 10%. So maybe, again, this can be kind of subjective, but maybe we say, look, if it's between 1.75 and 2.5, we add 1% to weighted average cost of capital. If it's between um, 2.5 and 3.5, we add 2%. If it's above 3.5, we add 3%. So we would add that to the weighted average cost of capital, and then we would recalculate net present value. So again, that's exactly how this all works as far as making some kind of an adjustment to the weighted average cost of capital. Now, is this project likely to be correlated with the firm's business or not? Right? How would that contribute to the overall risk? Well, we would, we would expect a positive correlation if this thing was highly correlated. So as long as the correlation is not perfectly positive, if you remember from our videos on risk, we would expect it to contribute to a little bit of lowering of the firm's overall risk. What if the correlation was 0.9? That means there's really not that much of a reduction, right? Only if this project is dramatically different from our current kind of business, 
would you expect its correlation to be low enough to dramatically lower the risk by creating this portfolio of projects? So again, ultimately, how would this affect risk? The project's corporate risk wouldn't be dramatically affected if it had a high correlation with, with the economy, but its high standalone risk correlation would also suggest maybe that its market risk is also very high. So to put it in, I think, maybe simpler terms, right? How does this project relate to what we're already doing? The higher the correlation between what we're already doing, the more likely the risk that we calculate, in this case, we talk, the coefficient of variation was around 3.6. That is a, is a good number to use when you're thinking about adjusting risk. But if it's dramatically different, we now have to look at how will this affect the overall risk of the entire company? How would it then affect the risk of our investors, our shareholders? How would it affect their risk in their individual stock portfolios? That's a much deeper, much harder question to analyze and come up with. Look forward to talking to you soon.